Have you ever wondered why India and China have the largest populations in the world? It is not because their population growth rate during the 20th century was exceptionally high. In fact, many other regions had faster growth rates during that time. The real reason is that they already had a massive population base even before the modern population explosion began, and that base multiplied during the second half of the 20th century. But why did these regions have such large populations to begin with? One major reason is that a powerful force of nature has been shaping life in this part of the world for thousands of years. Every year, with the arrival of June, the rainy season begins in the southwestern parts of the Indian subcontinent. But what many people do not realize is that this rainy season, what we call the monsoon, is not just a local event confined to that area. It is actually part of the largest weather system on Earth. It is called the South Asian Monsoon. The South Asian Monsoon brings rainfall not only to the southern tip of the Indian subcontinent, but also to a vast region that spans across India, China, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and parts of Southeast Asia. It affects the lives of nearly half of the world's population, shaping agriculture, economies, cultures and even politics across these regions. And this is not a recent phenomenon. The South Asian monsoon has been active for thousands of years. It created the fertile Gangetic and Indus plains and the Yangtze River basin, allowing early civilizations to thrive. In this video, we will explore how the South Asian monsoon works, why it is considered the largest and most influential weather phenomenon on Earth, and how it continues to shape life across the region even today. Hi friends, welcome to a new video from Science Simplified for All. It is believed that the word monsoon comes from the Arabic word mausam, which means season. Today, the word monsoon refers to a seasonal reversal of wind direction. In our case, winds usually blow from the northeast throughout most of the year. But for about four months, they reverse direction and blow from the southwest. This seasonal wind reversal happens in many regions above the equator across the globe. However, when it occurs over the Indian subcontinent, there is something unique about it. If you look at a world map, you will notice that India lies just north of the equator and directly south of India, there is no significant landmass, only the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean. This geographical setup is quite rare and this unique positioning plays a crucial role in the intensity and behavior of the southwest monsoon. But before we explore that in detail, we first need to understand why winds change direction when the seasons change. To do that, there are a few basic concepts we need to understand. We all know that Earth is roughly spherical in shape and rotates on its axis. When an object rotates, the parts farther from the axis move faster and the parts closer to the axis move more slowly. The same is true for the Earth. Earth has the largest radius near the equator. So due to Earth's rotation, regions closer to the equator move faster than those near the poles. At the equator, the surface of the Earth moves at about 1,670 kilometers per hour. At 30 degrees latitude, it is around 1,360 kilometers per hour. And at 60 degrees latitude, it drops to just 556 kilometers per hour. So, the farther you move from the equator, the slower the surface speed becomes. This happens in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Now, we all know that Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere. As the Earth rotates, the atmosphere rotates along with it. At any given location, the speed of the surface and the speed of the air just above it is nearly the same. This means that the atmosphere above the equator moves faster. And as we move closer to the poles, its speed decreases gradually. For reasons we will explore later in this video, there are times when air tends to flow either from the equator toward the poles or from the poles toward the equator. Now, let us consider a wind that blows from the equator toward the north, up to about 30 degrees north latitude. In theory, this wind should travel directly north, but there is a catch. At the equator, the Earth's surface is moving eastward at around 1,670 kilometers per hour. So, any air starting from there also carries this eastward momentum. 
As the wind moves northward, it enters regions where the surface is rotating more slowly. For example, at 30 degrees latitude, the surface speed is only about 1,360 kilometers per hour. As a result, the air retains more eastward momentum than the ground beneath it. So instead of moving straight north, it appears to shift to the right, moving in a northeast direction. Any wind blowing from the equator toward the north always curves to the right, that is, toward the northeast. It never travels directly north. Now let us consider a wind blowing from 30 degrees north latitude toward the equator. At 30 degrees, the earth is rotating eastward at 1,360 kilometers per hour, and the air carries that same momentum. But as it moves closer to the equator, it enters regions where the surface is moving faster, up to 1,670 kilometers per hour. Since the ground is moving faster than the air, the surface races ahead and the wind lags slightly behind. As a result, the wind ends up curving toward the west. So, a wind that should travel directly south will instead deflect slightly to the left, that is, southwest. This same pattern applies in the southern hemisphere too. Winds moving from the equator to the south will always deflect to the right or eastward, and winds moving from the south toward the equator will always deflect to the left or westward. This apparent deflection in wind direction is caused by a phenomenon known as the Coriolis effect, which occurs in any rotating system. Technically, the Coriolis effect is a complex topic and would require a dedicated video to explain fully. But for now, I have tried to keep the explanation as simple as possible without going into too much detail. Now let us understand why winds sometimes blow toward the equator and sometimes away from it. We already discussed that the Earth is spherical in shape. Because of this curvature, sunlight does not fall equally on all parts of the Earth. At the equator, sunlight strikes the surface almost directly, nearly perpendicular. But as we move away from the equator, sunlight falls at an angle. This means that the regions near the equator receive more heat from the sun, while areas farther away receive less. This is true in both the northern and southern hemispheres, and that is why temperatures drop drastically near the poles. Because of this stronger sunlight, the air near the equator becomes much warmer. As warm air rises, it expands and becomes less dense. This rising warm air creates a low-pressure zone near the equator. To fill this low-pressure area, air begins to move in from both sides, from above and below the equator. Of course, there is no up or down in space. But for the sake of explanation, when we say above the equator, we mean the northern hemisphere. And when we say below, we mean the southern hemisphere. So, as the warm air rises near the equator, air from the north and south begins to flow in to replace it. But as we saw earlier, these winds never travel in a straight line. Because of the Coriolis effect that we discussed earlier, winds always curve as they move. In the northern hemisphere, the wind moving southward curves slightly to the west. In the southern hemisphere, the wind moving northward also curves slightly to the west. This results in a consistent wind pattern on both sides of the equator. In the northern hemisphere, the wind blows from the northeast, and in the southern hemisphere, it blows from the southeast. By convention, winds are named based on the direction they come from, not the direction they blow toward. So the wind in the northern hemisphere is called the northeast wind. In older times, especially during the era of sail ships, this was called the northeast trade wind. Similarly, in the southern hemisphere, the wind blowing from the southeast is called the southeast trade wind. The place where these two trade winds meet, the northeast wind from the north and the southeast wind from the south, is known as the convergence zone. More specifically, it is called the intertropical convergence zone, or ITCZ. In the old days, sailors called this region the doldrums, a word that literally means a windless sea. Under normal circumstances, this convergence zone should always stay directly above the equator, because that is where sunlight is strongest. The air heats up and begins to rise. But in reality, the convergence zone does not remain fixed over the equator. At certain times of the year, it shifts to the north and at other times, 
to the south. Why does this happen? That is what we need to understand next. One of the most important factors controlling Earth's climate is the tilt of the Earth's axis. We already have a separate video that explains Earth's axial tilt in detail, so we will not go too deep into that here. But here is what we need to know. Because of this tilt, the Sun is not always directly overhead at the equator. As Earth spins on its axis, it also revolves around the Sun. Depending on where Earth is along its orbit, the location where sunlight falls most directly, in other words, perpendicularly, keeps changing. Only during March and September does the sun shine directly over the equator. In June, due to the axial tilt, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. So, the sun appears to shine directly 23.5 degrees north of the equator. On the line, we call the Tropic of Cancer. Then, in December, it is the southern hemisphere that is tilted toward the sun. So, the sunlight falls directly 23.5 degrees south of the equator, on the line we call the Tropic of Capricorn. If you look at a globe, you will see these two lines marked as dotted circles above and below the equator. As the position of direct sunlight shifts north and south through the year, the convergence zone we discussed earlier also follows this movement. When the sunlight moves toward the northern hemisphere, the convergence zone moves northward as well. This is clearly shown in this image. The red band represents the position of the ITCZ during June and July when it has moved well to the north of the equator. The blue band shows its position during December and January when it shifts to the south of the equator. There is another important factor that affects the position of the convergence zone. Land heats up much faster than water when exposed to sunlight, while oceans take a longer time to warm up. So, depending on how land and sea are distributed on either side of the equator, the convergence zone can shift more in some regions and less in others. If you look at the red area shown in this diagram for the month of June, you will notice something important. The convergence zone shifts much farther north over the Indian subcontinent. This is because of the uneven distribution of land and sea around the equator near India. To the north of the equator lies the vast Indian subcontinent, while to the south there is no major land mass, only open ocean. This contrast causes the convergence zone to shift more toward the north in this region. And it is this unique geography that makes the southwest monsoon especially intense over the Indian subcontinent. Earlier, we discussed how winds from the north and south converge near the equator. Now, let us see what happens when this convergence zone shifts northward during the month of June, as shown here. Winds from the southern hemisphere begin moving toward the convergence zone, curving slightly to the left due to the Coriolis effect. But when the convergence zone moves north of the equator, the wind must cross the equator to reach it. As soon as it crosses, something important happens. Winds traveling northward from the equator always experience a rightward deflection as we explained earlier in the video. So the same wind that was curving left in the southern hemisphere is now forced to curve right after crossing the equator. This shift causes the wind to blow from the southwest and that is how it becomes what we call the southwest monsoon. If we observe closely, we can see that due to the unique position of the Indian subcontinent on the globe, this wind travels a long distance over the ocean before reaching land, mainly across the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea, absorbing large amounts of moisture from the warm waters. The first major land masses the monsoon reaches are parts of South and Southeast Asia. When the moist air encounters mountain ranges like the Western Ghats in India or the Anamite Range in Southeast Asia, it is forced to rise. Rising air cools due to two reasons. First, the upper layers of the atmosphere are generally cooler. Second, as the air rises, it expands because the pressure in the upper atmosphere is lower, and this expansion also causes cooling. This process is known as adiabatic cooling. As the rising air cools, the moisture it carries condenses rapidly, resulting in heavy rainfall. This is why many regions located along the southwestern coastlines and windward slopes, including parts of India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, 
and southern China receive intense seasonal rains during this time. As these monsoon winds continue their journey inland, they eventually reach the towering Himalayan mountains, where the uplift of moist air causes further rainfall and snowfall. This precipitation feeds the headwaters of some of Asia's most important rivers, including the Indus, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. These rivers sustain hundreds of millions of people across South Asia. Further east, the Yangtze River in China, Asia's longest river, also receives significant water from summer monsoon rains, especially in its upper reaches and surrounding regions. In this way, the southwest monsoon plays a critical role in replenishing water sources that support agriculture, ecosystems and human life across much of the Asian continent. In most years, this entire weather cycle takes place during the four-month period from late May to early September. That is the only time when we receive winds from the southwest direction. Once this period ends, the wind direction gradually begins to shift. This is because by then, the convergence zone starts moving southward toward the southern hemisphere. By the time winter arrives, the convergence zone has completely crossed the equator and shifted to the south. As a result, from November to February, the winds we receive come entirely from the northeast direction. These are called the northeast trade winds. They are typically cold and dry winds because they do not pass over any major water body before reaching land. Between these two seasons, there is a transition period, the time between the end of the southwest monsoon and the beginning of the northeast monsoon. This happens during October and early November. During this period, northeast winds begin to blow across the Bay of Bengal and reach the southeastern coast of India, particularly Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. These winds carry moisture from the Bay of Bengal and as a result, these regions receive significant rainfall during this time. A small portion of this rain also reaches parts of Kerala. There is another reason why the northeast wind sometimes carries moisture. During the daytime, land heats up faster than the sea. As a result, the air above the land rises and moist air from above the sea flows in to replace it. This moisture-laden air mixes with the northeast winds during October and November, bringing rain to the coastal regions. This is also why the rainfall during this period often occurs in the late afternoon or evening. What we have seen so far is the general seasonal pattern that has continued for centuries across this part of the world. In addition to this, from time to time, these areas also experience low-pressure systems, cyclones and depressions. These can cause minor variations in the overall weather pattern each year. Even so, the southwest monsoon the retreating monsoon and the northeast trade winds have remained reliable and recurring seasonal phenomena for thousands of years, shaping the climate of this region. And it is this remarkable consistency that enabled the rise of civilizations and supported historically high population growth across these parts of the world. Through this video, I hope you gained a basic understanding of the southwest monsoon and the retreating monsoon. If you found this video interesting, please consider liking and sharing it. For more videos like this, do subscribe to the channel and enable the bell icon so you do not miss any updates. Thank you.